Okay, uh, as you can see, I'm going to be doing a qualitative study of Catholic Church capacity to mobilize support for Syrian resettlement in Chile. It's quite a mouthful. Um, my full name is up there. I go by Alex, so if you have any questions, you can address me that way. Okay, so um, I didn't see any refugee presentations on the list, so I'm just going to go quickly through what that means because it's very confusing. Um, there's a lot of categories of migrants. They include IDP, refugee, stateless person, asylum seeker, economic migrant, climate migrant. Climate migrant is not typically a category yet legally. All of them have different legal protections. They all fun, uh, fall under different bodies um, of government services and uh, UN agencies. So IOM versus UNHCR versus uh, UNRWA will come in there and uh, deal with different people. Although I was just in Mozambique and they're dealing with um, fallout from cyclones from a couple years ago. And um, UNHCR and IOM are both dealing with IDPs, which was very interesting. So it seems black and white, you know, when you do your internet research and then you go in and it's very, very gray. Um, but for me particularly, I'll be looking at refugees. So a refugee is a person who has fled his or her country due to persecution of war or violence. Um, persecution also has categories. So persecution can be for reasons of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. And even within that, particular social group is very specific. So for example, gender-based violence does not get you refugee status. Um, if you are a victim of gender-based violence, your gender does not count as a social group. So it's very complicated. There's many things to keep in mind with this. Um, and in terms of the numbers, 70.8 million forcibly displaced people worldwide. It's a huge issue. It's only growing as conflicts become more intractable and with climate change. Although, like I said, we don't have a category for climate migrants, so they don't really have a legal space right now. Um, but there are 41.3 million internally displaced people. That's what I mean by IDPs. 25.9 million refugees, 3.5 million asylum seekers. And like I said, these categories are all growing. Um, there's a lot of confusion in the media right now about asylum seeker versus refugee and what that means, um, they're very different. As an asylum seeker just needs to cross an international border and claim asylum status, and then that is adjudicated within the second country. A refugee crosses a border and claims refugee status, and then they are um, assessed by UNHCR and eligible for third country resettlement. But we'll get into resettlement later. Um, some more statistics for you. One person is displaced every two seconds. Half of the world's refugees are children. A third of the world's refugees, which are 6.7 million, are hosted by the world's poorest countries. 1.4 million refugees require immediate resettlement, and 92,400 of those were resettled in 2018. That is less than 7% of the number that need immediate resettlement. And immediate resettlement um, is not the 25 point. 9 million statistic, it means that there's a critical medical issue and they need immediate medical services, or that um, their life is in imminent danger, so they could have been a victim of human trafficking, and in order to escape those traffickers, they need to be resettled immediately to a third country. Um, different countries play different roles in this framework, so in particular, the US has historically been really good about resettling medical cases. A lot of them actually come to Seattle um, because we have fantastic medical care. Part of that is because the United States does not have socialized medical care, so those costs are incurred by the refugees themselves or the networks that they're able to leverage to receive that medical care. And on the other end of that spectrum, um, Europe and particularly the UK accept a lot of refugees who need, um, who need resettlement because their life is in imminent danger. 80% uh, of refugees live in countries neighboring their country of origin, so crossing that international boundary, you are not technically a refugee until you have crossed an international boundary. 57% uh, come from these three countries. Obviously, Syria has been all over the news in recent years. It's been quite impossible to miss that. Um, and 341,800 new asylum seekers, um, it, the greatest number of applications come from Venezuelans. I actually I was taking the elevator down from my apartment today and ran into a Venezuelan refugee. And he was like, I want you to interview, interview me. You must interview me. And I was like, well, you know, I'm technically interviewing Syrians, but it sounds good. It'll be good contextual knowledge. Um, so for our people who love visuals, um, these are the world's top 10 refugee hosting countries. As you can see, they're primarily around uh, the Middle East and Northern Africa. That makes sense because as we saw in the previous statistics, most refugees just cross the boundary or the border into a neighboring country. Um, although Germany has taken a lead role in recent years and has taken in one million Syrian refugees in particular. That looks a little different when you see who hosts refugees per 1,000 um, habitants. 
Um, Sweden actually takes the place of Germany in hosting the most refugees per capita. Um, so it's, it's just interesting how different countries um, choose to portray the optics. So a brief history of UNHCR. Like I said, UNHCR is the UN organization that handles refugees. Um, UNRWA handles Palestinian refugees, so it's completely different. Please do not ask me questions about that. I do not know. Um, but UNHCR operates with the 1951 convention as their basis, so the underlying principle is non-refoulement, and that means you cannot involuntarily return a person to their country of origin. Um, the convention was written in 1951, that is right after World War II, so the history here is very important. Um, it was written with World War II in mind, and particularly European refugees. Um, and so the original temporal and geographic limitations meant that it applied only to refugees from uh, the World War II conflict um, in Europe primarily, and only, yeah, so that temporal and geographic limitation. Um, and then in 1967, we have the Cold War, so that expanse. Um, and what that means is it applies to anywhere in the world and at any time. And there have been criticisms about UNHCR is that they you have, it has been used as a kind of political cudgel. So people would choose to take in refugees from communist regimes over non-communist regimes and say, oh, look at these poor people. They're fleeing this communist regime. We want them. Um, and the primary example of this would be Mexico and Cuba. So many more refugees were taken from Cuba than from Mexico because they could say these poor Cubans are fleeing communism and it you know, became a big media. Um, narrative. I should have included some of the beautiful newspaper clippings like you did, but that's okay. Next time. Um, and then beyond the convention and the protocol, different regions have taken different interpretations of how they are going to um, resettle refugees. So there's an OAU convention in 1969, and that includes events that disturb the public order. That allows the African nations to deal with refugees who are fleeing from failed or predatory states. So it expands the criteria and allows them to be a little more liberal with who they're going to take and who they're going to resettle. In Latin America, they go under the Cartagena Convention from 1984. So that includes generalized violence and events that disturb the public order. That has been used for gang violence or cartel-related violence, particularly in Colombia. That was the big refugee situation back in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, so all of these people in camps, I'm sure you've seen the photos, they're pretty dire. Uh, that's in, called warehousing, where you know all these refugees who cannot be resettled are just warehoused in these huge camps. It's obviously not a stable solution for them. So resettlement is currently the answer to warehousing. Um, and that is the transfer of a person from his or her country of asylum to another state that has agreed to allow him or her entry and provide a path to permanent settlement. Um, so what that means is you're moving someone to, from a camp um, to a third country less than 1% of refugees are resettled each year. So this is the solution. Is it a particularly effective solution quantitatively? Not yet. Um, resettlement typically occurs in North America and Europe, uh, but that does not imply that other regions of the world do not participate in resettlement programs. For example, Chile is part of the Emerging Countries Resettlement Mechanism. Um, a lot of my thesis research has actually been quantitative and been focusing on public opinion around the world. Um, the most, the world, the country that has the most favorable opinion of refugees and refugee resettlement is actually China, which is interesting. Um, and more countries are going to need to take on refugee resettlement roles, given that only 1% of resettle, refugees are resettled each year. Um, and so having these kind of emerging countries resettlement, emerging countries resettlement programs are really important as we expand resettlement efforts around the world. Um, like I said, refugees are resettled for these reasons particularly, so family reunification very low on the resettlement spectrum for refugees. Um, medical needs also fairly low. Survivors of violence and torture, lack of er, uh, and legal and or physical protection needs are much higher. So again, if someone you know is a victim of human trafficking and they are being pursued or their safety um, is in danger, they people will try to resettle them as soon as next day. Okay, so um, as of August 2019, Chile had received 10%, um, 400,000 of the 4 million Venezuelan refugees fleeing Venezuela, hence my conversation in the elevator today. Um, Chile is the number three recipient country after Colombia and Peru. In 2017, Chile hosted 1,736 recognized refugees, primarily from Colombia. 
Since 1999, Chile has resettled 480 refugees, primarily Colombians, but also Palestinians, Syrians, and refugees from the former Yugoslavia. Again, this language gets a little confusing because a country can host refugees, but they're not technically resettled to that country, um, if that makes sense. I can go into that in questions more, or, but the language is confusing, bear with me. So if you haven't gone through the, UN, the UNHCR process, you haven't been evaluated for two years, and you haven't been resettled to a third country, you can still be a refugee awaiting resettlement. Okay, um, being resettled just means that you, you, the country has accepted that you will be a permanent citizen at some point, that you have that path to citizenship. Um, and like I said, Chile is part of the ERCM, which aims to expand global resettlement efforts. So, um, to my project. In 2017, Chile welcomed 66 Syrians, 32 children, 16 women, 18 men from Lebanon. Um, Syrians, this is a good example. Okay, so when the Syrians crossed the border into Lebanon, they were refugees at that point, but they are now resettled refugees in Chile. Maybe that makes it a little more clear. So, the Syrians were resettled into two communities, Vija Lemana, which is near Viña del Mar, and Makul, which is in central eastern Santiago. I'm very excited. I saw they have a subway stop there today when I was on the subway. <laughs> Um, all refugees received intensive Spanish classes um, for up to two years, I read, which is pretty incredible, um, and psychosocial help from the Vicaria de Pastoral Social Caritas. That's one of my partners. I'm very excited. Um, adults received help finding jobs, and children attended local schools and kindergartens. Um, and the Syrian community in Chile was also actively involved in the integration process. I actually stumbled across a, um, a Syrian dentistry nonprofit that was helping these newcomers receiving dental care, which was really cool to see. Um, so just coming from the US context, this is very extensive help comparatively. Um, so I'll be interested to see how this plays out in real time. Okay, my project. So this is a qualitative case study that seeks to understand church facilitated integration efforts into resettlement communities, the ones that I mentioned. It will rely primarily on structured individual interviews and focus groups. My partners are University of Chile, uh, their Human Rights Center, and um, essentially the Archbishop's Office, um, which the Vicaria de Pastoral Social Caritas is through that office. Um, I will interview the refugees themselves, but the more important, or the aspect that I would like to emphasize in this project is talking to native Chileans who attend churches in these areas and who the churches are trying to target as they try to integrate refugees into these communities. So it's seeing, is integration more effective, essentially, when it is facilitated through a trusted intermediary, in this case, the church? Is the church more effective at stirring people to volunteer, for example, or donate, or go out of their way to say, hey, where are you going? Can I walk you to the grocery store? Um, grassroots efforts at local churches have been instrumental in garnering support for resettlement in the US. So the Archbishop's Office has done all of these amazing programs, right? So these Spanish classes. Um, and the psychosocial help, but the on-the-ground support is going to come from the churches and the community efforts that are actually in these neighborhoods. Um, and which efforts have been most effective in stirring support and facilitating local integration? Um, at least in the US, when we're working on advocacy and we're talking to a politician, um, and perhaps that person is not so amenable to refugee resettlement, it tends to be more effective if they are Catholic, for example, to go with a priest that has done a lot of volunteering with refugee communities, or if they're very interested in um, crime, to go with a sheriff, for example, that has worked very closely with refugee communities. Um, and so I want to see if that is the case here, particularly in a country that is more Catholic. Here's a cute picture of when they arrived at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys, for your time.